So for some of you who may know or may not know Beyond Conflict, I'm the uh, founder and CEO. We're coming up on our 30th anniversary. Um, and as an organization, we um, have worked in 75 countries around the world uh, in countries trying to go from conflict to peace or dictatorship to democracy. And our methodology and approach historically was the shared experience model of actually bringing in people across various divides to share their experience with people who are struggling with change. Um, and so, um, you know, that's a bit about our history. Um, we've, you know, in the early days, we're involved in what uh, starting and helping catalyze what became the field of transitional justice, uh, was involved in some of the early discussions that led to the Truth Commission in South Africa, and then a lot of work in Northern Ireland, Central America, and the Balkans. And because our approach is based on the power of shared experience, the toolkit in that work was the experience of individuals across divides at different levels who could have never imagined changed, uh, change in their own context. And I like to say that um, in some ways we're like a big support group on wheels, bringing in people who in their own context could have never imagined uh, transformative change and felt a moral obligation to share it with people uh, who are struggling through a process on their own. Uh, and I think as everybody on this call knows, change is not easy, uh, it's difficult, and a lot of people resist it, or they're afraid of what's on the other side. And so the ability to model change through the experience of people who have done some pretty important things in different countries and keep on reinforcing that experience uh, with people um, can make a lasting change. And because as I mentioned, we focused on the human experience, um, you know, we were always looking for new models, new examples to help people. And about 12, 14 years ago, um, I was teaching a course in university here in Boston on conflict transformation uh, in the 21st century, the human dimension. And every other class I'd bring a speaker in. And in one class, I brought Jerry Adams from Northern Ireland. You may know was one of the, though he'll never admit it, uh, one of the senior IRA leaders, but also the head of Sinn Féin. And a student asked uh, Jerry, how do you sit across the table from somebody you may have tried to kill or they may have tried to kill you? And he paused and he said, you know, it's tough to make peace with a humiliated partner. And there was a retired neuroscientist sitting in the class. And he came up to me after that class and he said, you know, there's a lot of brain science behind these themes that come up of humiliation or empathy or fear. And I remember asking him, what do you mean brain science? Because I knew social psychology research or you know, direct experience or observation. And he said something so practical and powerful. He said, speaking as a neuroscientist, he says, we're not rational beings with emotions. In fact, we're just the opposite. We're emotionally based beings who can only think rationally when we feel that our identities are understood and valued by others and our identities as we see ourselves. And that sort of like profound aha moment for me collapsed a lot of my experience and work. And I realized that we needed to start tapping into what brain and behavioral science could offer us. So uh, I, wanna give you, I wanted to give you a little bit of that background, how we started working with brain and behavioral science um, and how we started applying it to issues. And of course, after the election in 2016, deepening polarization in the United States became an obvious and important issue for us to think about, uh, both as an organization and as an American-based uh, NGO that had worked around the world. And also, um, and not surprising to people internationally on this call, I was hearing from leaders in South Africa, the Middle East, Central America, the Balkans, over the last 10 or 15 years, they would say to me, you need to focus on your country. And I would say, yeah, I know we have some profound problems, but they sort of like canaries in a coal mine could sense a direction we were heading in. They saw the language, the way people talked about others, the sort of deepening sort of segregation uh, and, and siloing that was happening. And they were deeply concerned. And so with that background, I want to go right into, if you can go, Karen, to the next slide. So I mentioned we started looking at polarization in the United States and long before the pandemic, I was thinking about sort of polarization is not only structural, but it's also becoming toxic. And we started thinking about it as almost a public health threat to the United States. This is 
well over a year ago. And the thing about, um, you know, if you look at a, a public health threat, it's like, how do we do the scientific research or the medical research to understand the problem we need to address? See if we can get some real evidence of what's happening. And then what are the interventions or things that could be done? So here are the, the, the sort of the markers of toxic polarization as, as we see. So the identities of Democrat Republican, because we're not a multi-party democracy, have aggregated many of our nation's social fissures and fault lines into one central fault line. Extreme polarization threatens American democracy. Now we know polarization uh, is inherent in any democracy. In fact, in the 1950s, political scientists thought there wasn't enough polarization, that Republican and Democratic parties were big tents and political scientists felt there wasn't enough choice for voters. Well, we've gone the other direction today. And so what we see happening is polarization is profound difference over issues is becoming one about identity. And we recognize that if we don't address this identity-based growing polarization, and we can see it happening, it's gonna threaten American democracy, which is imperfect. And if it's not addressed, it will, in our view, and I'm sure many others, permanently damage our institutions like Congress, the courts and others. And so these democratic and Republican identities have begun operating not as opposing political parties with strong positions and disagreements, but as social identities. The way Israelis and Palestinians may view each other, Shias and Sunnis in the Middle East or Catholics and Protestants in the Northern Ireland, establishing a form of American sectarianism. And what, what do we see? It's, it's eroding Americans trust in their institutions and democratic norms and increasing the risk for political violence. So then we look at what are the characteristics of a polarized psychology? And that's what, uh, when we get into Samantha's presentation, she'll talk about. So when, when partisanship becomes less about you and I with profound differences to us versus them, a whole range of, un of unconscious psycholog psychological processes come online. And that's a really important point to keep in mind. And as a non-scientist, that was a really significant point for me to learn. That once we get into sort of these identity-based um, ways of thinking, our brain operates in ways, and Samantha can talk more about this, that actually serve our group bonds than it does reason, <laughs> than it does a broader uh, way of thinking. And it, it really starts operating in this unconscious level about each other. And, and that also reinforces what I learned from scientists that we need to focus on how we think as humans and not what we think. Because close to 90% of how we think is below the level of conscious access. And by the way, if you look at the biggest challenges we face on this planet, from climate change to polarization and inequality and racism and so on and so on, you know, they're caused by human behavior. So we need to understand how humans think. What is the cognition and emotion that actually shapes how we engage in the world and with each other. And when those identity markers become more salient, then as much unconsciously, probably more unconsciously than consciously, we end up filtering and distorting uh, the world around us and the way we interpret information, the information we seek out and the actions we take. So if you can go to the next slide, Karen. So I want to, um, I think this is slide, which slide is this? I'm not sure if this is where I want to transition to. Uh, so if we go back one and then we'll transition to um, Samantha. So what did we do? Working with our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Samantha and uh, Emile Bruneau, who some of you may know and unfortunately passed away about a week ago and was really one of the creators with Samantha and us in doing this research. And um, so I want to both mention Emil and sort of dedicate this work to Emil, um, who was a brilliant scientist and a huge loss. Um, and uh, Samantha will talk about the research that she and Emil had done. And then that research, which was peer reviewed and published by the National Academy of Sciences, then led to this report, America's Divided Mind, which is more of a public facing translation set of recommendations. And, you know, I'll just say that what we're finding uh, is that Americans, uh, based on this research, 
believe that members of the other party dehumanize them, dislike them, and disagree with them as about twice as much as they actually do. So with that, I'll transition to uh, Samantha to actually present the research and findings, and then we'll go to um, where we go from here. Great. Thanks, Tim, um, for the introduction. Um, if you wouldn't mind progressing to the next slide. So as Tim mentioned, um, we tracked attitudes over a bunch of different time points. We looked at attitudes of over 3,000 Americans, and we assessed how much they think the other side either dislikes or dehumanizes them or disagrees on various political and policy issues. And so we tracked both actual attitudes, and we also tracked how much each side thinks the other side falls on either policy issues or dislikes or dehumanizes their own political party. And as I mentioned, we tracked this over three different time points, and these time points were particularly interesting. In November 2018, that was right around the midterm elections, and then we tracked attitudes longitudinally three months later to see whether or not there was any shifts in attitudes, and we again tested it a little bit later this year. And we've also looked at the consequences of some of these attitudes that we measured. So we looked at support for policies that put your party over country or broke down democracy in a harmful way. We also looked at trust in various civic institutions such as Congress, which I will get into in a bit. Next slide, please. So one thing in particular that we looked at was people's attitudes about various policy positions. And one policy, position in particular that we looked at was attitudes about immigrations. So as you can see from this slide here, there is a distinction in whether where Democrats and Republicans fall on the issue of immigration. So there is a lot of issue overlap. You can see the blue area is with Democrats position. So it's more liberal leaning towards open borders. The Republican position is more uh, conservative leaning towards closed borders, but there is still a fair amount of position overlap between these two groups. So this suggests that yes, there is some division, but it's not insurmountable. There is a lot of overlap and there is a lot of variation among both Democrats and Republicans on the issue of border policy. Next slide, please. But when you ask people, where do you think the other political party falls on these various issues, such as immigration policy, we see that people think there is a much larger divide on the issue of immigration than there is in reality. And this corresponds to the other policy measures we assess as well. So even though there is a lot of variability in Democrat and Republican position, and even though there's a lot of overlap in attitudes about immigration policy, people think that they're much more divided than they really are. Next slide, please. When we look at dehumanization, so we ask people, how evolved do you personally think the other side is? And then how much do you think the other side rates you as evolved and civilized? And we see that there, again, is this big divide between actual perceptions and what people think the other side would say. So really, people think that the, there's a, about twice as much of a divide in actual estimates and in um, perceived estimates of the other side, when really the divide is much smaller. There's actually a much greater humanization that the other side is expressing towards you than is there is perceived to be. And this can lead to really harmful consequences. Next slide, please. So for instance, we have seen from this research that this feeling of being dehumanized is a is predictive of greater support for policies that put your party over country. So what that means is people are willing to support policies that infringe on the First Amendment rights of other people. So for instance, limiting access of the other political parties' news sources, so limiting Fox News, or limiting MSNBC. And these are predictive of this feeling of dehumanization. So not actual levels of dehumanization, feeling like you're being dehumanized by the other political party is linked to this greater support of policies that again put party over country, such as the infringement on First Amendment rights, increased gerrymandering of congressional districts, um, and things of that nature. Next slide, please. And there's also a link to this feeling of dislike and this feeling of dehumanization to trust 
in political civic institutions. So the more people feel disliked, for instance, the less likely they are to trust civic institutions. So we see that there's really harmful consequences from this perceived division that perpetuates society and perpetuates a lot of the American public. And so we see that not only it leads to less trust, but also can support, lead to support of policies that can break down some of the democratic norms that we see exist in the American democracy. Next slide. And Tim, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, thank you, Samantha. And I mean, I just wanna just pick up on what Samantha said before I say, where do we go from here? I have some thoughts. And this is where I would love when we get into the Q&A session. Um, the response we got from journalists and the public to this report was pretty, not only overwhelmingly positive, but people really felt a sense of relief. So Ezra Klein wrote about this report, David French, who's more on the right, um, David Brooks, also sort of on the right. Um, but even on NPR and all things considered, the American people recognize and feel in their interactions, you know, their direct interactions, that we are not as polarized as what they think and see. And to have evidence that Samantha and Emil was able to pull together is really powerful. Um, and Samantha, you can also talk later, is even telling this information to people creates, in a sense, a cognitive shift. That just knowing this, there is evidence that knowing that there are these major misperceptions, research from Mina Chikara at Harvard and others and some of the work Samantha's doing actually shows that it creates a cognitive shift where people are more willing to think, uh, let's say, better about the other side. So we did this work not only as a contribution to understanding the psychology of polarization, but to guide us and others, where do we go from here? So if we can go to the next slide, please. So, you know, we don't uh, own all the wisdom of the world. Uh, we do these talks because we want to reach out to folks like people on this call and others who have real experience either here and elsewhere of how do you sort of both socialize and scale this information. Um, so the way we think about it today is we need to create awareness campaigns about these partisan misperceptions. Um, and we have various ways of thinking about that. So one thing that Samantha, for example, is doing now is some research and testing interventions um, that looked at how to correct these misperceptions uh, for the American public uh, through different platforms, whether it's animation, video, or written information. Um, what are the messages that actually resonate? Um, and how long did it last? Um, we are looking at maybe with some partners, a guide for evangelical communities on the nature of polarization, what it does and what they can do about it. And then actually take that research, develop a field intervention with some of these evangelical Christian communities and with them partner and test, is it actually working? Is it actually reducing polarization, creating greater warmth across these divides? and actually increasing people's capacity to engage uh, in dialogue. Um, we're looking at launching a science informed process aimed at depolarizing psychologies at scale, which goes to what I was mentioning about some of Samantha's research, which is not only looking at, you know, can it create a, a cognitive shift, but what's the best platform for doing that, right? Again, media, is it uh, animation? Is it a film? Is it a video? And then we're also, uh, and I'm just skimming some of this we're doing, and then also designing a toolkit for evidence-based dialogue. So we have been doing this for over a year now, where we have interviewed close to 30 leaders that we've worked with around the world and asking them in their best of experience what works and doesn't work. And we focused on people who come from the countries that were in conflict, not an outside um, you know, mediator or negotiator, but people who had a struggle emotionally. Uh, and in a sort of an identity formed way with change and transformation. And then we've been doing a literature review with colleagues looking at brain and behavioral science as it relates to dialogue, conflict, negotiation. And I'll give you two examples. One is sacred values, right? So issues that we hold to be sacred, um, it turns out we process in a different region of the brain than utilitarian calculations we make. And when I say sacred, I don't mean just in the religious spiritual sense. I mean in things that we as individuals and our groups decide uh, is above compromise, in a sense is sacred to us. 
Uh, for example, it turns out for a lot of Americans, the Second Amendment is processed as a sacred uh, value. It's core to their identities, something they don't easily compromise on. And there's a lot of research that shows that when people try to regulate a sacred value, people respond with aggression and hold on more deeply. And there's research that shows that if you give a symbolic concession, which is to say, you know, not that you have to then take on that sacred value, but that you recognize what it means to others. And so what we're looking for in that context are weaving together some of the best of practice and some of the best of insights and then bring it to communities like yours and others to say, what's missing? Um, how do we then, you know, bring this uh, to communities? And the last thing I'll say um, on this is we've been dealing with journalists and media uh, organizations because they're at the front of being um, targeted for polarization, quote unquote, purvey as a fake news. And they're not trained in how our brains work. What is the nature of confirmation bias? Uh, what is the nature of metamist perceptions and how they shape people's uh, perceptions and narratives? And so we've been doing a lot of work with journalists and we're looking at developing a media guide. So our goal is to be able to have not only um, partnership and collaboration and targeting those communities that actually have a big normative influence, which is really key. As so much of our behavior is shaped by norms, how do you target elected officials and policymakers with this information? The media, um, the public, religious and cultural leaders. And we're not naive not to recognize, uh, particularly among certain media, that there's an economic benefit to polarize. But there are a lot of journalists and others who don't seek to do that. And so we're partly uh, looking for more and more collaboration to test these, but we're also basing it in evidence. And so rather than taking intuition and putting it out there, we're actually doing with Samantha and some other researchers at Harvard and elsewhere, actual scientific evidence of saying, does it work? How long does it last? You know, is it actually changing, you know, not only people's, you know, cognition, but also their emotion? And how long does that last? And so with that, I'll just stop so we can get to Q&A. And um, thank you. Oh, I, I think I mentioned some of these and we can maybe skip on. Engage and train policymakers and opinion leaders to spread, to avoid the spread of these polarizing narratives. And one thing we're looking at is actually um, doing, re doing a similar study that Samantha and Emil did that led to this America's Divided Mind report with congressional staff and seeing if we're seeing the same dynamic at play. So these are some of the examples. And with that, um, I turn it over back to Karen and, and we're happy to answer questions, get ideas and, uh, and so forth. Wonderful, thank you so, so much for that. So without further ado, happy to, to start our Q&A and this can go the raise hand function, please feel welcome to use the chat function. We'll do our best to spend the remainder of this portion to go through as many questions and answers. I see, to just start this off, I see that Martin uh, just had a question. And my only request is that for those who have questions, if you could please turn on your video and then uh, please ask your question. So Martin, did you wanna share your question? And Sadia? And also, please, if you don't mind introducing yourself, just in case your peers um, don't already know you, um, that would just be really helpful too. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Martin van der Dunk from the Radicalization Awareness Network. And my question would be, uh, would your research method also be applicable in a multi-party democracy? Here you had the Democrats and the Republicans, so you had two parties, but would it also be possible if you have, like in Europe, a lot of countries have 12 or 50 parties taking part into the elections? Yeah, you can definitely assess this in a lot of different contexts. It becomes more cumbersome because you're asking a lot more questions. You know, what do you think this group thinks and this group thinks? But it's definitely applicable. And there's actually been research that has looked not necessarily with just Democrats and Republicans and within political polarization, but has also looked at different religious groups, also different racial groups, and how meta perceptions, this term of what you think the other side thinks about you, can really perpetuate a lot of conflict that exists in a lot of different contexts. And so these type of methods are definitely applicable to a lot of other nations with multiple party systems and also analogous con conflict contexts. And can I just jump in uh, on that? I, that's a really key point. Uh, thank you for asking that. Is uh, 
what's really exciting is the research that Samantha uh, and team did is apl applicable in other geographies and other contexts, right? And how much these misperceptions actually shape our view of the other and can either drive conflict or limit reconciliation. Uh, and for example, Emil did a lot of research the last three years in Colombia. As many of you know, after the signing of the peace accords with the FARC, uh, President Santos put a referendum uh, to the public and it failed on the first go around. And Emil was convinced that had the misperceptions research worked uh, or had been done before the first referendum, then we could have identified those places where there were some profound disagreements or profound narratives coming out of a long war, but also where people hadn't you know, understood the other side in, in necessary ways. So the, the, the research framework, I think, has a lot of applicability just to unpack these misperceptions that exist. Thank you for that. So uh, for q and I see we have Rabbi Rachel, and then after that, George and Milt. So if Rabbi Rachel, you want to share your question? Sure. Thanks so much for this. This is really important learning. Um, so I'm wondering, as we think about the upcoming election, which feels tense and heated, I think, to many of us, um, what, you know, given the research you've done with Beyond Conflict, what are your biggest concerns that you have as we approach um, this date? And um, what do you think that, in particular, I'm a religious leader, um, but any of us who are leaders, what can we be doing between now and then um, to prevent violence, um, other issues that may arise as a result of the elections? Well, may I go first, and then if Samantha wants to jump in, um, I mean, one thing it, it seems to me is just research shows you how much we misperceive on big issues and like and dislike and dehumanization, dehumanization across these divides. And a lot of that is shaped by where we get our information. And so right now, because violence on either side um, dominates a lot of the news, there is an assumption now, we haven't done that actual research, I'm sure others have done, but it's obvious that it shapes the narrative for a lot of people that violence is more pervasive than it, I think it actually is in this country right now, right? And so I think we have to recognize how much our misperceptions of the reality around us and what's happening, particularly across the divides, is funneled through a media filter that just exacerbates that and highlights it in ways I don't think really reflect reality. It doesn't mean that there are some real threats out there. I mean, what happened a week or two ago with the governor of Michigan was real, right? And so we need to be aware of that, but I think we need to be aware of it in such a way that it doesn't reflect that this is, I think, a, a growing norm and trend. At least I don't think so and hope so. And Samantha, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, so oftentimes, as Tim was mentioning, where we get our news from, it's very biased, it's very polarized. And one thing in particular about news and the media is that what sells is highlighting division between groups. Showing unity is, is less appealing, is less exciting to, to talk about um, on the news. And the news that we're often exposed to is our, as news that confirms our existing biases and our existing beliefs. We're in these echo chambers where we are exposed to news and media that that confirms our biases and we oftentimes don't look at media with a critical lens to understand or kind of look at the context behind it. We don't expose ourselves to um, either media of the other side or media that is maybe a little more neutral in rhetoric. And so this constant information that we're, we're receiving can definitely perpetuate some of the, the misperceptions that we might have. But importantly, what our research shows is that by having positive contact with people of the other side or people who are dissimilar to you is really effective at reducing some of these misperceptions. Now, it's difficult to have contact with the other side, especially since we are oftentimes also geographically um, uh, with, uh, with people who are more like us. We don't really have a lot of interactions with people who think differently than us. But there is research that shows that having a positive contact with other people or having exposure to maybe some news sources or news media on the other side can be effective at reducing some toxic polarization. But getting there, there needs to be this willingness, which is hard. It's hard to seek out information that just confirms what you believe so strongly, especially when we're constantly inundated with a lot of polarizing media. 
Yeah, and can I just, I think that's a really, thank you, uh, Samantha, key point. You know, positive contact, I think everybody in this call knows that a lot of dialogue uh, in reconciliation and conflict work is built on contact theory. Um, but, you know, contact is a very sort of complex, problematic uh, engagement. And one of the things I personally find very exciting as well about this research is that in a lot of the work we've done around the world, we would have to spend years bringing people together across size to other countries to be able to reflect on their own situation and to humanize the other because they bring so many legitimate grievances, narratives, loss, but also a lot of narratives that have been shaped, particularly where there's violence, right? Where people are dehumanizing the other side. They're not quite like us, right? They're a real threat to us. And it took a lot of that contact and engagement for people to say, wait a minute, we actually have more in common. And of course, we all know that there are huge psychological limits and burdens when there's an asymmetry, let's say, in conflict uh, communities to actually sit across with the other. And what I find really promising about this research, if you could actually correct a lot of those misperceptions before people even go into contact, I think you're really gonna improve the ground for better dialogue because you're not asking people to compromise. That's one of the big things I think we all know is people are afraid to compromise. Well, compromise is a dirty word. But when you realize, wait a minute, the other side is much closer to me, for me to engage with them is less a threat because I'm not being asked to compromise. We actually don't need to compromise at that level, right? Because we have so much more in common. And so I think the ability just to correct those, and, and, and I think in my view is, creates the conditions where people may be more willing to have contact. Um, and I think these are the, the things that I think we need to be able to unpack more and actually test more. I know that we have a few minutes left and that Samantha might actually have to leave us in a few minutes. So I'm just gonna suggest that we take a few questions at once um, and then allow those to be answered um, just so that we have the opportunity to, to have as many of the questions at least posed even if they can't be answered, we can find another mechanism through which they can be. So um, maybe if we just want to group two or three questions. That's on, then might I suggest uh, George and Milt? Okay, hi, I'll be quick. I'm George Weiss, uh, I'm the director of Radio La Valencia. Uh, the, and I'm speaking to you from Amsterdam. We make soap operas and video games and things like that too. Uh, my, my question, uh, is is simply how so how do you bring your information to a reactant audience so the, very simply I mean strategically speaking all the all the all the all the research in how to bridge polarization is not in the strategic interest of 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 the the the, the polarizing side right now in the in the states or in any other place also so there is how how do you make people more receptive towards your research and how do you make them use it in order to sit closer okay we want to have people sitting closer together how do we get them to sit closer together when obviously one side is actually much more interested in aggravating conflict than in than in creating less conflict that's my question Milt, we cannot hear you for some reason. Um, might you try to unmute and now? Is it just me? Okay. Um, Melt, I'm sorry we can't hear you, but I can direct um, the attention to your question in, in the Zoom chat, if that's helpful. Um, and I apologize um, that, that we're not able to hear you at this moment. Um, but Milt's question was, how can we get leaders to take effective measures to deal with threats to humanity, such as climate? How can we, um, so climate, nuclear arms proliferation, um, the remedies for which are well known. Um, and, and I think perhaps that, that, that question, Milt, sorry, I'm going to try and channel you a little bit here. 
um, is sort of, if you're presenting this research around polarization, how does it actually get applied to addressing other um, leading challenges and issues where perhaps the solutions are well known and yet the movement towards getting agreement and action on those solutions is, is, is maybe not happening as quickly or smoothly or well as, as intended. And I'm sorry, Mel, if I have completely misinterpreted that, please correct me in, in the Zoom chat because um, I don't want to misrepresent anything. Um, so Tim and, and Samantha, perhaps if you want to respond to that, and then we do have Sammy and Nancy as well um, who have um, more questions, reflections to share. Samantha? Do you want to jump it? Because I know you probably have more yeah. limited. Um, so the first question was about how do we actually physically bring people together? Um, and it's, I think the media can be a really good uh, piece. I mean, it's hard because people, I think, again, aren't really willing to do it, um, especially if um, we're ge geographically separated. Um, I know, especially in the States, there's a lot of research that shows that people tend to live in areas with like-minded people, um, so it's hard. Um, I would like to argue that some people, I, I would think that generally people might be more willing to hear the other side. I think if people are approaching the situation um, with a really open mind, which of course for everybody, it's, it's gonna be impossible. Um, but I, I would argue that people might be more willing than we might perceive people, which kind of goes into our misperceptions about what other people are willing to think about us. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, some work that's looked at actual willingness to engage and, um, people are, the, there's a mismatch between what, how willing we think people are to engage and what actually people are willing to engage. And there is greater willingness, um, to engage than, than I would think. Tim, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, but Samantha, um, some of the research you're doing right now taps into that, right? Can you just briefly explain a couple of things you're doing and how that might help that? Um, so we're, we're looking at correcting misinformation. Correcting misinformation leads to increased willingness to engage with the other side. We know that misperceptions lead to more social distancing or wanting to disengage from the other side. Um, and so through, through various research of, of contact-based interventions that I've been working on, um, bringing, I, I guess, either in giving people the opportunity to engage um, can actually be pretty effective, but breaking down some of the psychological barriers that might lead people to not want to engage the other side is really important to do first as a first step um, in order to kind of inc uh, promote better engagement. Thank you. And just to the, the, the question, uh, um, Sadia, that, and I'm reading what Milt wrote here, you know, um, I started working on climate change in 1989, uh, trying to educate journalists to the greenhouse effect. And, um, and, you know, in those days that introduced to a lot of journalists, the idea that they need to focus on it. But here we are today where, where climate change is, is absolutely real. Um, and, you know, one of my colleagues um, described going into a congressional office to talk about gun control and, and, uh, and, and finding that a member of Congress staff was, uh, you know, given polling that showed that the majority of people in that community supported, you know, universal background checks and so forth and so on. But the staffer said, but I'm not hearing from those people, right? Or, so in other words, that staff person's perception or misperception of the level of support um, is filtered through who people hear from and who have the loudest voices, right? And so, you know, I, to I think Milt's question, you know, whether it's polarization, whether it's climate change, whether it's nuclear proliferation, I think we need to unpack a lot of the misperceptions that exist. And it's not traditional polling. It's asking the question that Samantha said, what do others think about it? And what do I think they think about my position on that? And the more we can unpack that, the more I think we can start to find ways to maybe communicate them differently. Because it's not just that you unpack these misperceptions. The question is, how do you then frame and communicate around those misperceptions to actually create change. And then I think you mentioned Sadia. Uh, uh, well, I'll continue on. I saw a couple of questions here, but I'll defer to you guys which ones you want to prioritize. Well, we, we so we have a number uh, of questions, perhaps even more than we will have time to share answers for. Um, however, um, I think that it will be uh, good to for, for folks to be able to at least 
share the questions. And then perhaps Tim, if your team is willing to put in the chat box a way that people can follow up with you, um, whoever on the team would be the best to follow up with, um, we can help continue the conversation that way. Um, but we do in the chat box have um, reflections from Sammy, Nancy, Theo, Susan Benish. Um, so I'd like to at least in, invite those to be posed to the group, understanding that we have a little less than, than 10 minutes to be able to try and, and answer them or at least um, start to consider them. Um, so Sammy, would you like to expand any on the reflection that you shared in the chat and then Nancy Theo and Susan Benish? You know, it's, um, I do, thank you for, I learned so much just on, on maybe even how to articulate a little bit better some of the concerns we face routinely through the work that we do here at Life After Eight. Here at Life After Eight, of course, for those who, who may not know, we're, we're a nonprofit that is um, providing um, exit strategies for men and women in uh, white supremacist or violent far-right groups here in the U.S., um, and then we spend a lot of time uh, training community members in, in our approach, and I think Samantha was saying, you know, being open-minded, uh, there's research out there that shows that your approach matters more than your theory. And so I think that has to be a part of the open-minded spirit uh, that Samantha was talking about. Um, the only thing that uh, I, I disagree 100% with, 100% of what I heard, the only thing that I was concerned to hear is, is denial is, a, is the first sign, right? So I, I'm aware of how this is going to sound. Um, but... I do not think that when it comes to domestic terrorism in the United States, that I think we have like an opposite problem. We, we're, at, at least at the government level, we're downplaying uh, the risk of domestic terrorism from the violent far right, uh, minimizing it, and then, and then talking about um, the so-called, which I think is a false comparison, alt-left, uh, that's not even a real term. Um, it's something that was coined, but it's not actual based on on, um, on, on the facts. So I, I, did, I do think that when we're talking about this, we, we have to be careful because I, here in the country, I think we are downplaying the risk uh, of white supremacy and domestic terrorist attacks. Uh, the research supports me in that and saying it's, it's actually a much greater threat than most other threats um, here on, on domestic terrorist soil or on domestic soil. So I was just a little, I know what context you're saying it, but I also want to make sure that it's, how, it's, it's on the other end of harmful when, when, our, when our government is downplaying um, the role of domestic terrorist threats here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, Sadia, you know, I can continue past 12. Um, and, um, and it's Sammy, right? Um, maybe if you, if you don't mind, if I could just quickly. I, I Thank you for saying what you said, because I think I, I was thinking about it after I said that. One of the things for me that I recognize powerfully in this work over the last decade with scientists is how much norms really shape so much of our behavior. And when things get normalized, as we can see, they, they grow in potential and reality. So I, I think your, your point is really important is not to discount it. I mean, on one hand, not to exaggerate it, but at the same time, not to ignore it because we do live in an environment where our president is normalizing a lot of this in ways that are deeply uh, deeply concerning um, and the other thing I just wanted to say is about open minds um, when Samantha said that and I think of the historic work I've done and I'm sure many others what creates a capacity for an open mind when you're sitting across the table one of the things that I learned that's really important from experience but science confirms is how much we need to feel understood as individuals, right? There's almost, as a colleague of mine who's a scientist said, a biological necessity to feel understood as a human. And it may be not that you need the other person, the other side to understand the way you see reality, but to recognize that that's how you see reality. And it's a deeply felt need to feel understood. So when it relates to open minds, I think a precursor to open minds is too many people come together because they're there to build consensus, reach agreement, or, or reconcile. To me, I think one of the most important steps to get people to even think of approaching a conversation is they're coming to a place where they can bring their identities 
and feel like the other side may not accept and agree with them, but they understand what they mean to me. And, and I think that to me is a basis of coming in with an open mind. Um, and I think Nancy, I looked at an earlier question, Nancy asked about how do you scale some of this? You know, we're uh, supporting some research over at Harvard with a team that's looking at gaming platforms. And for the last two years, they bring together liberals and conservatives and they get paid um, to play a game that's designed where their identities of liberals and conservatives are there, but through like different stages of the first one being, okay, um, cultural re relevant questions. So name the, the cast of Duck Dynasty. Well, it turns out more conservatives can name the cast of Duck Dynasty than liberals. Name the cast of Stranger Things. It just turns out that more liberals can name the cast of Stranger Things than conservatives. And in a game, when two people are playing as members of a team, when one says, oh, I know the name of that Duck Dynasty cast, they're rewarded for their cultural knowledge. They're not shamed or stigmatized. They don't feel like, oh, I'm being treated in a certain way. I'm actually being rewarded by what I know and the community I come from. And it happens to the other side. That mutual cooperation, based on people feeling validated for who they are, we're finding in that test can last for one hour game for four months. And what's exciting about the potential is as almost like a response to the Russian troll farms, you know, which, and, and that is a metaphor, but also a real world thing, is they keep on reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing into this world we live in. Well, can you imagine the scalability of a gaming platform to get out games that reward cooperation based on who people are and not being afraid to be who they are? And we're finding that that reduces um, mistrust, increases warmth to the other side, and, and, and decreases polarization. So these are some of the things with different partners we're trying to test and say, wait a minute, how do you find something that can potentially scale? And that's one that has the potential because so many people gain uh, to scale in the future. And, and Sadia later will tell us the, the cast of Duck Dynasty. I'm like, uh-oh, now you've made me worried about what this says about me, that I can in fact name the cast of Duck Dynasty. You bridge all divides. Um, <laughs> we have, we are at four minutes to the hour. Um, I know that we have a number of participants who will need to leave us um, right at the time that we had set. However, the Thought Partnerships team is happy to stay with Tim and continue to um, field and answer questions. We certainly don't want to cut this conversation short. Um, in the event that you do need to leave um, right at the hour, please don't hesitate to do so. We completely understand. We're very grateful for you to be here. Um, also, the Beyond Conflict team, Anna has kindly shared um, an email address that you can continue to be in touch um, with the team on. Um, for those participants who are members of our community of practice, um, we can set up a discussion forum where you can tag members of the Beyond Conflict team and continue to ask your questions there. Um, and also, um, we can share with you a link to our open resource library for anyone who doesn't have access so that you can find um, all of these research reports there, as well as through the links that we shared in the chat. Um, because his name was mentioned, um, I just do want to take a moment to um, just hold a space for Emile Bruno, who was an extraordinary oh. member of our community of practice, someone that many here had the privilege of working with, someone who we will miss dearly, and someone whose work along with Samantha's and the rest of the Beyond Conflict team that I hope that people will really use to um, confront and tackle these collective problems that we are wrestling with around the world. Um, and from Thought Partnerships part, we will be next month as perhaps we surface out the other side of the US elections, um, be hosting a featured section on our open resource library that, that seeks to share and elevate the work um, of Emile Bruno, just so that everyone is able to access those tools and resources. So just wanted to acknowledge that and just hold a moment of space um, before um, participants have to leave. Um, and just to, to thank Tim and others um, for bringing him into the space and circle with us and that it has been such a tremendous privilege and, and we hope that his work will live on um, for, for many, many decades to come. 
Um, so for those who can stay, please stay. Um, we are happy to continue um, on, um, you know, for, for a while, um, as long as Tim and others um, are happy to indulge us. Um, and so we did have, Nancy, was that your question answered or was there, was there any additional part to the question? Okay, so Theo, if you're still with us, I know that, that you had a question and Carl, that you also posed a question around resources for educators, which was similar to a question by Elizabeth from Millions of Conversations. Um, so if you all are still with us, um, please feel free to chime in. Theo, would you like to go ahead? And then Susan uh, Benish, I know that you also posed a question. So I'm happy to take those. Theo? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for your report. And I was just curious about the messaging aspect uh, to build awareness around uh, you know, the, the science of this when um, you know, science has been in fact denied and, and these sort of anti-science narratives um, have been normalized by certain politicians. So um, what I, I'd basically be interested in learning more about um, the, the type of science-based messaging campaigns that you would recommend. Well, uh, thank you, Thea. That's a really important question. And that's, uh, unfortunately, Samantha had to go teach a class, uh, but that's one of the, um, you know, we touched on briefly. One of the things that Samantha is researching, um, and she's at the Annenberg School of Communications doing this work, uh, and it's, you know, what is the, the most appropriate messaging that creates, that speaks to both affect and cognition, meaning reason and emotion? Um, does, is one more productive than the other? Is it a combination of the two? That's the level of sort of analysis. And do you do it through an animation video, uh, animation short, a, a video short, written materials? And, you know, what framing works? And, and so that's the, the process we're in now. But, um, you know, I have a colleague, Mikey, and not to put you on the spot, but I uh, recently was joined by another uh, PhD in the field um, who's going to be actually looking at these interventions and thinking about how to frame this um, in a way that we can communicate. I mean, the, what's really interesting is um, certainly whether it's Fox or you could say MSNBC or other platforms, you know, certainly drive intentionally or in some cases, maybe not intentionally give them the benefit of the doubt, a lot of these polarizing narratives. But in my experience with a lot of journalists, they're struggling with this, where they don't want to do this, right? And so we're working with them to say, how do you frame narratives? How do you tell a story differently that actually not only brings a reader into that story or that paper, but doesn't reinforce, you know, polarization or confirmation bias at the outset? Um, so these are some of the things we're trying to figure out. Um, and we're also tapping into people who have some of these communication expertise. Um, so what we're looking at at this stage is the evidence that as much as that we can demonstrate that this sort of framing works, but then now testing what's the best way to get that out there in a meaningful way. Thank you. I wish I had a more concrete answer, but that's the process we're in right now. Thank you so much, Tim. Also, I see Elizabeth just shared a message saying she has to head out to class. Um, but Tim and Beyond Conflict team um, and others uh, on the call, if there are particular resources for educators, for students um, that can be shared, um, I know Carl Wilkins also had a similar question. Um, please do either drop those in the chat or, or let us know. Um, we're very happy to make sure that we can get those out to, to folks who want to be able to use them. Uh, and if you have any um, thoughts or, or reflections on that um, that you, you all would like to share now, please do. Yeah, we, we certainly, uh, my colleague Anna can, and, uh, and the team can pull together some of the resources uh, that we're making available um, in research. And we can either send it to you guys directly, also point to where it exists on our website. Uh, but we're also in the process of doing a literature review on the toolkit for effective dialogue of looking at some of the best practices and some of the science. Um, and we recognize how you communicate around science is also important because there is a lot of resistance out there. Um, so I'll just mention that. And the other, whether it's MILT or others, be happy to follow up uh, and think more broadly about some of these broader issues um, and how some of this reframing can be done. Um, because what's behind this report is a science-informed design process that we apply to a range of the programs we're working on. 
whether it's you know violence in Kenya, polarization in the United States, Islamophobia, and so forth, is really you know bringing a process of really interrogating people's theories of change, and saying how do you measure success? Um, and one of the things you know I've learned from science is that norms have a bigger import, uh, impact on behavior than raising people's awareness or just changing their attitudes. So really interrogating people's theories of change, looking at how they measure success, and then actually testing with those organizations or groups, is that actually effective and working and over what period of time? And whether it's climate change or whether it's immigration or Islamophobia or polarization, that frame we're taking to pretty much everything. Thank you, Tim. Susan Benish. I'd love to say Susan or Susan B, but I, we in fact have two amazing Susan Bs with us today. Um, so Susan Benish, um, would you like to pose your question? Yeah, I'll introduce myself uh, as requested. I'm um, the director of the Dangerous Speech Project and also just wanted to flag that, um, and I, I guess I'll also say that the Dangerous Speech Project, we. Uh, spend lots of time studying the awful ways in which people communicate, but uh, we are increasingly um, uh, studying ways of, of undermining that harm or disrupting polarization and, um, uh, and what we call dangerous speech, which is any kind of human communication that lowers normal barriers against violence. Um, I wanted just to flag that my wonderful colleague, Kathy Berger, our director of research, worked with a team, well, first she traveled to a, a, a variety of American campuses to do some field research, and then she worked with a team of grad students at the University of Connecticut to build um, a toolkit for uh, use on campuses to get um, constructive dialogue going um, among people with uh, different backgrounds and different views. So I um, responded to Elizabeth in the chat uh, giving her Kathy's email address, and if anybody else is interested, please use that. Terrific. Yeah. Um, and then my question was was about something I see as a sort of a corollary to the findings that Samantha and Emil reported, um, which is that uh, um, uh, uh, and I should say other research indicates, uh, along with my own qualitative, subjective impressions, uh, that when people are thinking about um, the other side, and we all use this phrase, you yourself used it, Tim, that they, they view those people as a, as a homogenous uh, block um, who are all tremendously committed to positions antithetical to those of the, of the, of the of the research subjects. In other words, you know, if I think about Trump voters, I tend to think of all of them as fervent, extremely convinced, uh, uh, let's say very strongly on that side when the reality is that there's quite a spectrum. I noticed this most recently in um, reading comments on a very beautiful essay published just in the last few days by the American novelist, Marilyn Robinson. If you haven't read this, I strongly commend it to you. Uh, she refers to the United States as a family, believe it or not, and says, in a family, you, you accept other members with their flaws and, um, and offer them um, a, a kind of default of uh, 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 default of compassion and comprehension, even even when they think and say and want things very different from what you think and say and want. So it's a it's a long and beautiful essay, like uh, brilliantly written, like her novels, um, in which she appeals to Americans to to join her in thinking of the country as a family and therefore trying to heal these divisions. What struck me is that in reading the, the comments in response to her piece, I saw so much despair and uh, failure of willingness to take up her challenge or uh, uh, lack of optimism. People, people spoke 
about wanting to leave the country. I'm out of here as soon as I, as soon as I can go, people wrote. Um, and, I, and I also saw signs of uh, this idea that everybody on the other side is, 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 is irredeemable, hopeless, evil, um, um, and of course, impossible to, to um, converse with. So anyway, that's a very, sorry, that's very long-winded uh, and not really a question. But what I want to know is, is whether Tim, um, beyond conflict uh, generally, and some of the researchers you're working with specifically, have considered this particular point, whether um, it's true, as I'm, as I'm suggesting, that, that people see the other side as a, as a monolith, when in fact they're not. Um, and whether if that's true, it would be useful to educate on that specific point. Um, even regard, I put in the chat that, that even my, my strong belief is that even regarding such super polarizing issues as abortion and guns, uh, that a relatively small proportion uh, of Americans have strong views and a large proportion are in the malleable middle. Well, first of all, thank you, Susan. I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. So um, the- um, Right back at you. What was the name of the writer again? I thought, because I want to read that article. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. And okay. I'll, I'll, while you're talking, I'll, I'll find okay. the link to her piece. So um, a couple of things to your question, um, or to your really important quote. Um, so in recent talks, I have reflected less on the science and more what I've learned from incredible people. You know, one of the great privileges of my life that is I had spent time with Nelson Mandela and he was on our advisory board. And when I would bring people from Northern Ireland or other countries to see Mandela in South Africa, he would say to them, be tough on structures and institutions, but not on each other. Mm -hmm. And I remember we took a group of Bahrainis after the Arab Spring there, Shias and, and Sunnis, and Mandela had passed away and his chief speechwriter told me a story and told the group a story that in 1990 when Mandela was giving his, coming out of prison and giving his big speech to the world, the speechwriter gave him a draft. And then he met one-on-one -on -one with Mandela and he got it back with all these handwritten corrections. And Mandela had written about F.W. de Klerk. I think people on this phone I sometimes have to tell people who F.W. de Klerk was. Uh, who have, he, he said about F.W. de Klerk in one of the handwritten edits that F.W. de Klerk is an honorable man. And the speechwriter said, how could you say that? You're coming out of nearly 30 years in prison. Your people have suffered. This is not what they want to hear. And Mandela reached over to him and said, this is the two of them. He said, it is up to him to disprove it. What Mandela, who's become this sort of motherhood and apple pie, iconic, almost cliche, was a profound human who had his own struggles, but he had leadership and vision. And what he decided in that moment is I have such intense at this moment, political and moral authority. How does it benefit me and my people to hold it to myself? I am gonna build a bridge. I'm gonna give a loan to this man to help him be the partner he needs to be. He recognized emotionally that a lot of people in his community would have a problem with that. But he felt it was more important to bring this community across the bridge. And there is example after example of people less famous who have done similar things. And we need to be able to do this in this country, right? It's to be able to say, how do you build a bridge across to the other side? And to make them partners. And, you know, the science is a couple of years ago, uh, maybe five years ago, we did a conference with the El Hebrew Foundation in Washington. I remember. And it was on Islamophobia. And Emil and I and a couple of, and we were, I think Emil was the only scientist, behavioral scientist there. And the challenge given to us was, um, what, what can brain and behavioral science help us? How can they help us with this issue of Islamophobia? So what did Emil do? And we met afterwards. Well, as humans, we think in mental models of the world. We think in groups and we think automatically in milliseconds. So how do we overcome collective blame in the brain, to your point? And he took a group of white Christian Americans who would ask the question, not talk about how the brain works, 
But ask the question, um, should all white Christians be responsible for what Dylan Roof did in South Carolina? And the immediate response is no. We know our in-group, they said it automatically, and, they, and their mental view of their world, of course, he doesn't represent us, he's crazy. Okay, should all white Christian Americans be responsible for what Timothy McVeigh did in Oklahoma City? The same response. Then he said, well, what about the Westboro Church? Same response. So what he was doing was teeing up context in their brains. Yeah. And then he showed them images of a young Muslim woman from Amman. Should Amina be responsible for what happened in 9-11? They paused and said, no. Well, what about Muhammad here from Tunis? Should he be responsible for what happened in Orlando? No. So by literally going into the mechanism of the brain, and context is so important, by contextualizing their in-group, he then introduced somebody from an out-group that has a really negative stereotype, and their brain would say, unconsciously would say, well, that's hypocritical to hold that individual. So that one intervention for 10 minutes, we have evidence in Spain and the United States lasted a year where people didn't sign petitions against Muslim immigration and other things that were anti-Muslim. And the point is, is that we need to understand how we think. And so context is so key. So how do you overcome that? And he's got incredible evidence, you know, and you can do this in other seconds, just for people to contextualize and base it in what they know in their mental model of the world, which is literally how our brains evolve and come online between four and eight, by the way, is one way to have evidence that you can overcome the instinct towards collective blame to outgroups. So matching that science and then matching the wisdom of Mandela's and many others about the nature of creating a bridge to the other side. Thank you. And it sounds as if Emil has uh, come up with a method also. Yeah, and that's one of the things um, we, were, we were looking to do before Emil got uh, sick with cancer about 18 months ago. We were talking to various public transportation systems in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, LA. All their marketing advertising companies would not allow us. We were going to put um, these little posters in, for the next level on the train. So when people go to work and come home from work, it would show Dylan Roof and says, we don't hold all white Christians responsible mm -hmm. for the to Dylan Roof. And the next image is of a Muslim individual. Should we hold all Muslims responsible for the, for, for the actions of Al-Qaeda? And just people seeing that, what does it do? Oh, their brain says hypocritical, hypocritical, hypocritical. And we are exquisitely attuned to context as a species. And the more we can recognize how we think and then test and design, and that's where the science is important. Like, how do we overcome that? How do we then reduce collective blame? And getting more evidence is, is a big part of what we're trying to do. This makes me now wonder if one could use similar techniques to humanize uh, Trump voters in the minds of those who despise Trump and vice versa. Well, one quick thing, and then uh, we can move on to other questions, is I mentioned earlier this research on gaming um, that we're doing with our colleagues at Harvard. I just saw some results that show that that one hour game, you know, not surprising, has a four month positive impact. It declines each month. But the conservatives maintain a higher degree of warmth to liberals than liberals do to conservatives. And one hypothesis that I was discussing with the lead researcher is that one of the big divides that we have in our country is between people feeling looked down upon who never went to college and those who they feel looked down upon them because they went to college or they're more sophisticated or they have X, Y, and Z credentials. And when people are treated with respect and not stigmatized for who they are or what they don't know, their warmth lasts longer to the elk group. And that's, you know, we have to test that further and see if there are other drivers to it. But, you know, this is huge. And so the more we recognize across these divides that these perceptions or misperceptions exist and evidence that just by treating people with respect for who they are and rewarding them for who they are, their warmth lasts longer because people want to be treated with respect. It, it 
feels intuitively right as well. So I want to thank everybody. And I feel like, especially with those of us who are left, I suspect that we could chat with one another all day. And that would be a beautiful, wonderful thing to do, except that I have a suspicion that perhaps there might be other things that we also need to do. Yeah. So I hope this rich conversation can continue. And I would love to share some reflections that Milt and, and Milt, would you like to see if we can hear you now? Otherwise, I'm very happy to share um, your reflection to the letter uh, to the editor that, that you wrote today before joining. We still can't hear you, Milt. Milt, we still can't, I'm so sorry. We still can't hear you. I'm not sure what has happened with the audio on your side or if Zoom has just um, thrown us a bit of a wrench today. Um, but could I, would you mind if I read what you shared over the text? I'm sorry, I know that's so frustrating. Um, so Milk shared um, over the chat, he said, just before the web webinar, I wrote the following sentence in a letter to the editor. If we could understand why such otherwise competent people oppose taking the actions we must take to avoid catastrophic results, such as the hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths from the coronavirus, we might be able to make more progress. And Milt, I'm not sure if you'd like to share in the chat any further reflections you have to that. Um, I think that in, in sharing that statement and that reflection, it is to tie into this conversation, like a much larger question about why it is um, that even in the face of evidence, perhaps those that have the competency to take actions that can actually be towards the betterment of many or the prevention of um, harm towards many um, or the reconciliation of many don't otherwise do so. I'm sorry, was that a question to me? I think it's to you, to the group. It's, oh. it's something that, that Milt was reflecting on as he was listening to the conversation. And I yep. apologize that he can't, um, convey that it much more articulately than he would much more articulately than I can. I'm just trying to, to share the reflection and, and I suppose to ask if, if it provokes any, any thoughts or responses. I'm taking up all the oxygen here. Does anybody else want to uh, jump in? I mean, no, I mean, it's, it's such an important, um, gesture it's a, a you know there are no easy solutions in in this space we're in as a country right so we're dealing with polarization but we're also dealing with the issue of how do we restore democratic legitimacy in this country um how do we deal with our past all of things all of these things are deeply connected um and but our capacity to deal with all these issues means that we have to find ways to actually humanize each other um and you know where each state has two senators and i saw a statistic in the next 15 to 20 years the vast majority of the american people are going to be living in 20 to 25 states that means the other half of the country um, could have a veto power in the senate um, or you know if if we're not bridging those divides then the capacity to deal with whether it's climate change or inequality or you name it, um, is going to be really difficult to achieve. Thank you so much for those reflections. I know that Melt um, is, is involved with, um, with work in this regard. Um, and so Tim, what I'm going to do is just, um, I'm going to share Melt shared his contact information and he would love to be able to stay in touch and Sure. Um, and more. Um, and so I'm going to make sure that I share that with you before we lose each other. 
Um, but thank you everybody for joining um, the conversation today. Thank you um, to the many who have stayed on well beyond our allocated time, Tim, including yourself um, and, and members of your team, Michael. Um, I, I know that that's no, no small thing. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Um, we will share around with everybody that RSVP'd for the event, um, follow up information, um, links to reports and resources, ways to continue the conversation both through our platforms, but also directly um, by being in touch with the Beyond Conflict team. Um, so stay posted for that. Um, and thank you again uh, for everyone who took the time to join. I hope that this was helpful, Tim, also for you and your team. Um, and, you know, look forward to continuing the conversation. And, and let's hope that we come out the other side of November intact and able to continue mending.